Uh, Jesus didn't have a problem with people that's in the streets. He had a problem with religious people. How can I help anybody when I'm not even when I was not even able to help my own son? I would never do that. I would never do that. And I became that in a matter of minutes when they took my pain pills away. And I said, I'm not where I want to be. But thank God I'm not what I used to be. Ugh. This is Faith in Your Recovery. I am Randy Davis. Welcome to the battle. Thanks again for joining us. Welcome to Season 2, Faith in Your Recovery. When you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, we're here for you, and we want to be with you. We get the struggle, the challenge, the stigma, that sense of loss, the guilt, the pain, the hurt, the remorse. Well, whether we're your first choice or last chance, we believe that together with God, we will make a difference. I'm your host, Randy Davis, former pastor, as well as founder of A Better Life, Brianna's Hope. We're participant-driven, faith-based, compassion-filled, support and recovery movement for those battling the battle with substance use disorder slash addiction. Our guest today comes to us from Marion, Indiana, or at least over that direction, John Humphreys. Welcome, John. Hey. Good to see you, Pastor Randy. Good to have you here. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us. Look forward to what you have to share. I always tell the folks we're about all things recovery, and we've had, gosh, we're up in the 50s now, probably with the podcast that we've done. No two are alike. No journeys alike, no recovery efforts alike. You're highly involved in the battle. You understand that, yes? But yes, sir. Yes, sir, we are. <laughs> yeah, we want to hear about those experiences, your story, the story of others. We respect not using names, but uh, we know we can still tell those those struggles and those victories and how others got there and hope somebody out there will pick up on that and they'll think maybe just maybe that worked for me. Have you ran into anybody yet, John, in all your efforts as far as recovery that you had no hope for? You just couldn't see a path for them? Or do you believe there's one for everybody? I think, unfortunately, it, fe it feels like, I think for me, I, I see people sometimes, and when you're dealing with them, like, they don't have a chance. And but God has other plans, and then you like you see them start to change, and it blows your mind. And then there's other people you're like, oh, they're going to get it, and they just haven't got it yet to this point. So I think I think there's hope for everybody, but there's also free will. And some people, you have to get outside of yourself, and it's very difficult for some people because they, whether it's selfishness or guilt or um, shame all of those things like it's their heart they're hard to reach because they either feel like they don't deserve it or they feel like they've done nothing wrong yes yes so. i think that idea of personal choice that god gave us i'm not sure if it was a blessing or a curse <laughs> sometimes all right yeah that uh but there's a way to be obedient to listen and to find that path and there are folks like you and many others along the way yeah that will help guide steer and direct you can't do the work for them can you. No, we've tried. I when I first got into recovery, like I would drive myself crazy trying to help somebody, even get outside of myself to where, uh, or outside of you know my spiritual stuff, and not even pray about it anymore, and be like, I can save them. And it took me probably a couple years to realize I I can't save anybody. I've never saved anybody. I'm just a messenger. I have you know I can give hope and I can get you to the resource. Um, that can help you, that can change you, change new life, whatever, you know, I feel like if you really, you know, if you really encounter what I encountered, and we can get into that in a little bit, but if you encountered what I enc encountered, it's, I didn't change, I was made new, you know, so. Good with all of that. So, give the folks kind of a, this is a John Humphrey of today. Yes. Tell them where you're at in your recovery professionally, family uh yeah let folks get to know you a little so i've been in uh i've been sober for since uh, since two, um 412 or um 424 2012 um and I, I how do you remember that specific day well it's i remember it because i had 
um, I had been in addiction, I, and at the time, I, my two, my preferences were methadone and fentanyl, and I had moved away from, I had two daughters, and I had to move away from them to try to get myself together, and um, in the past, I had tried to m- maybe try to get sober, clean, whatever you want to call it, made it two or three days, and I just couldn't do it, and this time, like, I... Um, I had some take-home methadone bottles, and I was uh, really struggling because I didn't really have any legal rights to my daughters, so I didn't know. I was just really broken and hopeless, and it was the first time, like, I um, I had nothing to offer. I was a thief. I was on probation. I had this addiction, and I didn't know when I was going to see my girls again. And I was around family and moved back home, which was Marion, but I happened to be up in North Webster at the time, and I uh, was trying to wean myself off of the methadone, and I thought, you know, I had a plan, and it was like, I'll, you know, just try to be a better person because I thought my girls deserve to have, you know, a parent that is um, sober. I, th- I, was, I thought it was going to be miserable, but all, I would go to restaurants and stuff after I left the girls because I really had to leave them to find this path. And I would see, like, a parent with their kid, and I would go to the bathroom and, like, cry because it was just, I, I loved those girls, and... Um, having to leave them just broke me in a way that I didn't know I could be broken. I didn't even know, I didn't, I don't even think I was aware that I felt anymore. And then carrying that and not knowing when I was going to see them again and having to drive away from them and, um, you know, not knowing what was in the future for me, uh, with them. I just had always thought that I was going to be there regardless, but stuff had just gotten too bad. Um, and I don't know if you want me to tell what happened that day for it to be so memorable. Sure, go so, ahead. This is a good point for that. Well, I um, so I had been in an addiction. I was I was I think I was thirty five years old, and I had been in addiction. You know, whether it was alcohol or weed or whatever, I just progressed into harder and harder stuff since I was probably nineteen years old. I played with stuff before that, but um, and everybody told me like, I I couldn't get off of this stuff. I was going to get sick. And I had a friend, his name's, um, Aaron Euler. He's okay with me sharing his name, um, was getting a hold of me, texting me scriptures and stuff. We haven't seen each other. We hadn't seen each other forever. And, um, you know, I was like, the faith stuff's cool. I didn't believe it. I had been going to a church here in Anderson. Um, they bought, they bought, or they rented this old school building and my, my brother and sister-in-law, we're going to Anderson University at the time, so I was actually living here in Anderson, and I went to this church, and it was a hippie church, and they had coffee and stuff, so it started to expose me to um, some of the faith stuff, but I didn't believe it. I just thought it was a good idea. You weren't ready. No, But not the at seed all. was being planted. I just, I wanted my girls to have the opportunity to live a better life than me, and if that was Jesus, whatever it was, I wanted them to have that opportunity, so... In that, I started taking Bibles home, and uh, I started reading. So this is before I moved out. I started, I, I couldn't read, I couldn't understand them. And this was like random Bibles they had on a rack, and I was a thief at the time. So, of course, like I'm taking a Bible or two every week, different colors, all this stuff. And I went, um, one Sunday, I looked over at the rack, and there was this blue Bible, and it was a big one. And I was like, I'm going to get that one before I leave because I don't have a blue Bible. And... Most people worry about the version. You yeah. worried about the color. Yeah, I was a thief. I, I mean, if it, <laughs> you didn't I, care. Yeah, I spent I spent a night in jail here, and some of the stuff that I had got caught stealing, it was a problem. It was just I had, I got addicted to everything. So if it was like once I started stealing, I just got addicted. I would steal dumb stuff, and I was also fueling my habit because you know working and stuff was. I worked randomly. So I was just, I was a thief. I liked to use, you know, I, I just was, my head was all messed up. I just was attached to the wrong things. And yeah, I didn't care what version, but I knew there was some versions I couldn't understand. Sure. There was a King, like I tried to get in King James and I was like, this is, gotcha. no, I can't, like, I don't understand. But this blue Bible, I got it home and I opened it up and it was a study Bible. And as I started to read through it, I could understand it. And there were side notes in it and all this. Yes. And uh, so I got into the book of Matthew. And what I started to realize is my house was chaos. And I think anybody that's been in a relationship with kids that's in active addiction, you already know. You're fighting over everything. Kids are screaming all the time, running around. It is madness. 
always. And then you wake up and you get you wake each other up in the middle of the night fighting about something. Nobody trusts anybody, and that was the chaos I lived in for years. And I started to read this. I started to read the book of Matthew, and I got through all of the you know the bloodline stuff, and um, I started to read the story about Jesus. And when I would read it, everything around me would calm down, and I was actually feeling peace, which was alien to me. And I didn't know if it was because I was like, so I, maybe I was a good reader. I, you know, I didn't know what it was, but I, um, I found peace as I started to read the story about Jesus. And what I found myself doing was going, you know, I found myself running back to this book to continue to read because I was finding peace in it. I still didn't believe the stuff I was reading necessarily, but it was, there was something about it that had me. It was working it was, on you and in you. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it came time, so, so I had that exposure in the church and I was raised in church, but all of this, I think this is, um, this happens to a lot of people. Um, it was all cartoony stuff to me. If you, you know, I remember coloring pictures of, you know, the ark and you know samson and these things but it was all just stories you know i didn't have a relationship with god or christ or anything like that i just i tried to white knuckle it be a good kid that didn't work for me so then i just went the total the, the total other direction and i was just a bad kid you know and there were no rules uh, you know i had no boundaries on what i would do so take you back to North Webster. I'm weaning myself off of this methadone. I have my friend Aaron is texting me scriptures. And I'm like, I'm thinking in my head, like, I, yeah, what I'll do is I'll go to church, what, you know, Christian people do. To me, a lot of uh, people that I had experienced outside of, you know, some family. But like when I, I worked in the restaurant industry and Christians are miserable. You know, Sunday, it's like there is the worst day to wait tables or cook because they're angry. And I didn't want that. But I just, you know, I in my head, it was like, you know what? I guess I guess people go to church. That's how they change. So I was like, I'm going to go to church. I did not believe any of this stuff. I just wanted to be better. And I didn't want to hurt anymore. And in this brokenness of not not being able to or not knowing why I was going to see my girls again, and this just this heavy. How old were your girls at that time? Oh gosh, John? let's do the math. So it was um, Remy. Remy would have been five or six, and Blaze would have been probably two or three. Okay. Yeah, Bla- Blaze was probably two because she was really small. And when I had to, like, when I was leaving, I was trying to explain to them, like, I've got to go get a job and all this stuff. And Remy's always been kind of like this. She has this caregiver nature, and I was holding her hand, and, and she was like, well, Daddy, don't cry. And I'm, like, bawling, and I, I, I tell people all the time it's the worst. Um, dis- it was the hardest decision I ever had to make because I didn't have a license, or I had a license, but I didn't have a vehicle or anything like that. And my aunt came to get me, and as I was driving away, um, I had lived enough life to know that moments – once they pass, they're gone. And when things change, they're changed. And when you, when you make decisions, you know, most of the time it can't go back to what it was. And I was looking in the rearview mirror at the girls, and they had an older brother, too, that I loved to death and helped raise. And they kept getting smaller, and I'm trying to, like, hold on to this as I'm driving away, just trying to hold up off to, onto this, like, image of them just playing in the front yard. And then we turned, and they were gone. And I was crushed. Um there was nothing that there was n- there there's there's not a pill not there was nothing that could get me through that that pain nothing you know talking to people it helped as i was talking to them but when i was done talking to them i was right back in pain it was a band-aid for the moment yes for a very brief so i fa- so i was up in north webster because everybody said i needed to go up there with some family maybe take a couple days get my head straight and i had some take home methadone bottles and i uh was drinking my big old cup of coffee that I would drink. It was a ritual thing, and I was going to go wean myself off of the methadone. I could not, how I just couldn't shake how crushed, I, how bad I felt, like how how much I was hurting, and even even in using, like I nothing would nothing would numb it, and it was just like I'm going to wean myself off of this methadone. And I didn't know exactly what my plan was after that. Uh, my plans always worked out so great, you know. And so far, it's so been far, so successful, so we're, right? We're killing life up here, you know. And uh, 
but no. So and so I was I was drinking that coffee, and I remember on the TV there was a there was an old pastor, you know, because I was trying to watch the Christian shows. And to be honest, like we need to do something about that because they're bad, and it, it was really dry. Not all of them. I don't mean to offend people. Not all of them are bad, but some the the ones I was watching were a little dry. But the guy, so he had got he was reading letters, and and one of the letters was like, can a Canaanite could a Canaanite have been saved? And as he's answering that, and I believe he said yes and everything, I just remember that because that was the noise on the TV. And my phone's vibrating because my friend is sending me scriptures. And I stood up, and I started to walk to this methadone, and I just put my hands out. And I was like, Jesus Christ, if you're real, like, I want to believe, but I don't. But, you know, I am hurting so bad right now. And if you're real... I need you now. I've tried everything. I need you now. And boom, I was face down on the carpet in the presence of Jesus Christ at the feet of the cross. And, and mind you, I didn't even believe in this. So I look up and I'm, I'm feeling this. It's perfect love. You know, and, and it's something that doesn't exist in our daily life. And it's just, it was it was almost overwhelming. But I was at peace and I just... You know, you look up, and in our human nature, it was like, you don't know how bad I am, you know, and you don't know what I've done, and I would I would think of something that I did, and I just felt him grab it and take it from me, and this went on for, I have no idea how long, and um, all I know is that in that moment, if I could, if I could take people to that place with me, this sharing the gospel thing would be so easy, you know? And so, you know, and I, I kind of, you know, it was over and there was snot and tears all over the carpet. And I, I got up and I was, you know, the first thing I think I thought was like, I'm not telling anybody what just happened here. Cause they're going to think I'm one of those crazy gonna ones. Haul you off. Yeah. And, um, but I went to pick up my methadone bottle. Again, I'd, I had only been saved 45 seconds. I don't know what Christians do, you know. And so I, I wean their self off methadone. I don't take, know if they take pain pills. I haven't been, you know, given the information on that yet. But I picked up I picked up my methadone bottle, and I heard an audible voice say, put it down, you don't need it. And I put it down, and I... Um, which I know now, like, I, I feel like I got kind of baptized in the fire first, and, and what a blessing that was, you know. Um, but I put, I put the methadone bottle down, and I called the methadone clinic, and I got with my counselor, who my counselor always looked out for me. She cared about my kids. She, she wasn't a bad person. She's trained in her stuff, and I had just sure. had an encounter that doesn't make sense to people. So I call the methadone clinic and I get on the phone with her and I'm like, hey. And she's like, hi. I said, I'm not coming back. And she said, oh. (laughs) She said, well, did you find a doctor? And I said, no. I think I just found God. Crickets for a minute. And she was like, well, you're going to be sick. And what I've learned in this journey, and I've seen this happen so many times, is somebody will get a, a vi- God will give somebody a victory or a miracle, and the enemy's still waiting right there. He wants to kill it before it grows into anything. Yes. So as soon as you get it, and that's what I tell people, like we'll be at our services or services like A Better Life Beyond His Hope, and they'll have this encounter, and then they go outside, and the first thing that happens is, oh, that didn't really happen, or, oh, you don't deserve that, or a family member says, you're still the same, because the, the enemy is here to, de- he wants to destroy things in infancy. Plant the f- doubt. Yes. So she said, you're going to be sick, and I was like, look, whatever I just encountered over here is strong enough to get me through anything that I'm about to face. And I really, I thought I was going to, you know, I was waiting on these withdrawals. I literally just cut I was wearing fentanyl patches three or four days a week, snorting Adderall to clean. But I was on I was on the methadone f- regularly for years, and and I waited for these withdrawals, and I waited for these withdrawals, and I waited one day, three days, and I was like, it's coming, it's coming. Seven days, fourteen days, six months, a year, five years, eight years, ten years, and they never came. And I used to be 
I used to not like to share that so much because I know withdrawal is some of, you know, some of most of people's stories in recovery, but it's okay. I, I, it's okay. Like this, this was my journey. Thank you. Yeah. And, and God, he he worked a miracle in my life and I would be, I, it's not up to me if I share it or not, because what I know is that I met him and there was a miracle in my life. And when I came up from that carpet, I wasn't perfect. I haven't been perfect, but I was new. And, and the things that I took to the cross that day, like my daughters, I think, um, 13, maybe seven months after that, they came to stay with me briefly. And two years later, I had full custody of them. That, you know, this stuff doesn't happen on paper Mm -mm. unless you're reading it from God's word and it's not written out. It doesn't show us the plan. That's where our trust, our faith, our obedience has to take over. And I appreciate you sharing your story. That doesn't mean it's going to be somebody else's and they're no less if you know, this or that isn't suddenly taken away. Uh, God can work in a still small whisper as a thundering waterfalls. He can come to us in multiple ways. Absolutely. We just need him to come. Maranatha, and, come Lord, come. And if you understand the source that you have access to, whatever your road is, it's going to be easier. Absolutely. If you yes. have Christ to lean on, I promise that because we've seen it, it will be easier when faith it, it starts yep. to take a bigger role in your life. So in a minute, I want to go back to those darker days. But mm-hmm. before we do, tell the folks more of where you are now professionally and relationally, okay? So I I still have custody of my daughters. They're, they're amazing. Remy's about to turn 16. Blaze just turned 13. I, uh, I'm a recovery coach, peer support specialist, uh, kind of freelance right now. I work right now. Well, I do uh, drug court and reentry court in Wabash County. Um, and I, I still work with uh, Hope House Marion. And i you know, there's always, we're all, we've always got stuff brewing, but we just, um, my fr- me and my friend Cody Knuckles just got invited last year to go into um, the Wabash County Schools for uh, drug prevention um, talks and assemblies, and that went really well. So we're actually working on um, lining up more schools to do that, especially with this fentanyl um, epidemic going on. Yes. Kids today don't have the luxury of like testing stuff like I did because we, with my job with CORE that I was with for two years, I would do responses when somebody overdosed in the ER and I went in there and there was a 14 year old that they had to Narcan five times because his stuff got laced with fentanyl. And then there was another one. I think he was 17. He thought he was taking a half a Xanax and they had to Narcan him because it was straight fentanyl and the pill looked just like a Xanax, even to those of us that are professionals, you know? And so that's what we're, I think my heart and I, you know, and I know my friend Cody, that's what we're wanting to start to do is maybe get to the place where um, before they make the decision, you know, we can we can dig in and be like at least. Preventative instead of react. Yes, and, and give it to you from people. Cody spent 11 years in prison, and I, you know, as a father, but also as a son, and like we lived it. You know, it's not, it's, it's the approach of we, I've lost friends. I've had to write eulogies. I've. Um, we have, and it happens, especially with the fentanyl, um, with all of that mess, it's happening to us on such a regular basis. Oh there is no such thing as experimenting with no. drugs anymore. It can be one and done. Yeah. Uh, it can be your first one or your next one. Yeah. And, uh, there's no coming back at certain point. No. So let's back up to your darker days. Mm -hmm. You've shared with us the victories, some of them, of course, there's many more, but go back to those days where you were struggling the most, John, what your drugs of choice were, (laughs) what they did to your world. I know you talked about how you had to separate yourself from your daughters and how painful that was, but I'm sure there's some other details there, if you'd please share. Yeah, so I think... You know, a lot of people have um, different kinds of traumas that that get them into that. I, I just seen a post 
the other day that said trauma is the actual uh, gateway drug. Yes. Um, and and for me, I think with uh, you know, I had some some issues with you know circumstances growing up, and I just didn't. I didn't understand my identity and I wanted to fit in someplace. And at first it was being a class clown. I tried to do it with sports and things like that. And I did okay. I, you know, I had a good personality, but, um, I just, I also emulated some family members that sold dope and, you know, lived that life. And I, I saw that as so glamorous, you know, I had, I had, you know, people taking me to church and stuff like that, but the draw to that lifestyle was really was just you know I was just drawn to it so I you know I, I would you know started skipping school and drink. What age? At um, what age were you starting was, to skip school? Around sophomore, a sophomore. I, I Early exper- high school. Yeah, I, sp- I I experimented with alcohol. I think when I was when I say experimented, once I started, it was on a fairly regular basis, maybe eighth grade. Okay, playing with that, but it got really bad. I started smoking weed. Um, playing with acid and stuff like that. Then I started, you know, occasionally selling a dime bag at school and stuff. I was, I thought in my head that, you know, I was going to be, you know, the dope man, but I was never even close to that. But, um, yeah, so I think searching for that identity and a, and a place to land, you know, and a place to be accepted. And, um, and, and I just, the crowd I was running around with, I just, I kept getting deeper and deeper in. They accepted you. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the norm with that group. So obviously you're one of us. Yeah. And they would fight, you know, if you were getting into a fight, they fought with you. There, there is a level of loyalty to that. That's hard, you know, that I, that you don't see with other groups and stuff. So once you're in there, you know, then, then there's, it's, there's violence, you know, drug use, just, you know, constant, constant turmoil of some point conflict. And so I, um, there was a stigma on like crack and cocaine and stuff when I was in high school, but eventually I, um, I moved to Muncie for a little bit and there I started to play with, um, cocaine, crack, um, moved again to Indianapolis and started, you know, sprinkling crack or cocaine in my joints. And I, uh, I just, uh, I don't know. I liked, I liked the up and down of it. And, you know, I was just, I was searching again for something to make me more courageous, more bold, all of the things I didn't like about my personality. I was trying to medicate or, um, you know, just find something that made me more energetic or more outgoing or, um, something to calm me down. And that was kind of, you know, I just ended up, I think Coke, cocaine and, Drinking were my thing for a few years once I got to Indianapolis on a regular basis. I would wake up, lace a joint, smoke it on my way to work, you know, take stuff with me to work, sniff it. Um, That was basically it. And I just, it was, and I was having, like, we were having parties at our house. And it's everything that um, some in the music industry and all, it's it's the life that everybody's supposed to want. And I was living it. And I was, I, I, I just would sit there and be six, seven o'clock in the morning trying to figure out if I'm going to call off work or go to work. I haven't slept and just bouncing back and forth, swaying back and forth, so miserable and so empty. And the only thing you know how to do is like, well, I guess, you know, lace up another joint and go and just start it all over again. But I was, um, I was very, I was just sad. I, I was really sad. I, I didn't. Nothing was genuine, not even the relationships at that point or anything. It was just... I get the feeling you didn't even know where to look for something positive. You were so mm-hmm. wrapped up in your your self-diagnosis of who you were yeah. and what you were about. Yeah. That you didn't amount to anything. Maybe I'll amount to something if I try this or turn yeah. that direction. Well, then you get into it doesn't even matter. I don't even care if I amount to anything. Yes. In this life, like it doesn't matter, you know, I'm just here for this day. I'm just here for this hour. I'm just here, you know, and I, I remember, you know, moving forward when I was on fentanyl and uh, fentanyl patches and, and methadone, I uh, was sitting on the couch one time. This was after I had kids and I started to nod out and the high felt different. And it was like, I, I felt like I was fading a little bit. And I remember thinking like, it doesn't, you know, if I live, if I die, it doesn't matter. It's all the same thing. You know, it, who cares? What is it possible to share with us? I'm going to say it this way. The darkest moment that you recall. 
I well, I think it was. I think it was just a series of places that I went because I had gotten to where I was stealing off of everybody. Um, I had I had stolen off of my grandparents. I, uh, me and my girlfriend at the time did not get along. I, you know, we were accusing each other of all kinds of stuff, and I think my my head was in a really dark place then. I think I wanted to die. Um, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't say that I was suicidal, but it was just like, if one of these things take me out, it has got to be better than this. That's okay. Yeah. And I think the whole, the whole string of it's dark. That's an interesting question because, um, I don't know the last time, like I've really processed, you know, what, what, what was the darkest moment for me? Like the most heart broken I was, was obviously at the end of of my addiction when I found Christ, but I think there was just some, there was dark years that just all meshed into each other and felt like just yeah. never ending. It was so dark. There was no light. So no, when the I moment mean, it was time. I mean, we were, we would go into your house and take stuff. You know, I don't know how many times, like I, I could have probably gotten shot, um, I, you know, pr- stealing from people that are, that were probably dangerous. Well, I know they were dangerous and just, there was no sitting in a sitting. I remember sitting in a trailer park driveway for like eight hours waiting for somebody to come back with stuff, you know, and, and I was a total slave to this. They co- at the methadone clinic, they called me 1611 and I answered to that like, my name was irrelevant. If you called me 1611, I came running and I was just, it was, it was like this groundhog's day of like, I wake up, I do these things just to survive. I'll go to sleep tonight. Hopefully, um, you know, find some Klonopin or Xanax so I can just crash out till it's time to wake up again. Um, repeat the behavior all over for years, for for years years and years. So, uh, what about incarceration? Was there some of that? I, I've just... been in I've been in jail for a few times. Like you know, I I spent a couple nights in jail, and Short I've been I've been on pro yeah I've been on probation a few times, but okay. I never had the um no I never really got I, I got caught for st- stupid stuff outside outside of I did catch a felony in Hamilton County from stealing from my job, but it it um just turned into probation so. I'm going to guess there were times you could have and maybe should have been well, yeah, in I mean, jail for longer periods, but you weren't caught at that moment well, for that crime. Some, some stuff I got caught doing and people just didn't turn me in. Okay. You okay. know, like uh, th- there's been times I had been caught. Um, I feel like, yeah, you know, it may be in somebody's houses or somebody knew that I took something from them and um, they showed me grace. Yeah. So let's go a little different angle here for a few moments. Talk to the individuals out there who are running around like that chicken with their head cut off like you were. You know, you'd go for this pill or that drink or this drug or that drug. Talk to that individual who's in the middle of that struggle. Give them some advice. I know Christ is going to be first on that. Yeah. But take them you know, help them get there. If somebody was listening to this right now and was struggling the way I was struggling, the thing that I would tell them is stop for just a minute. Stop and think about the people that you're hurting. Think about your family and don't look at it in a way of like self-pity um, and and shame and guilt, but look at it like, what do, you know, do I have in, do I want to correct this? And don't think to yourself, like, think about how bad you're like, because I used to tell myself, like, being sober would suck, but being high all the time and chasing drugs sucked. So, like, I think, you know, that barrier of like, oh, it's going to be awful, like where you're at right now is awful. You know, it, like it's dark, you're, you can't trust people, you're stealing, you know, you're doing whatever you have to do, just take a minute would be my suggestion to you and really process like where is my life and understand that you're not too far gone. You're never too far gone as long as you're breathing, no matter where you're at. As long as you can ask yourself that question, you've got a fighting chance to get the answer. Yeah. And, and there are all kinds of resources out there, but I know what I, what I hear a lot of people, Oh, I've, you know, I've screwed everybody over. Well, we, so did I. And, but that does that don't use that as an excuse 
to keep screwing people over, to keep doing what you want to do. Um, because that's what I did for years was it was, oh, well, I'm horrible and I've already stolen off of everybody. So, and I just continued the behavior and I, you know, the offenses against people were worse and worse and worse. And that's not, that's not an excuse. You in this moment right now have a choice to try to get right or continue what you're doing, but yeah. don't continue what you're doing and blame your own choices. Like don't keep, don't cycle and say, I've screwed everybody over. So there's no reason you screwed everybody over. That's one of the reasons to seek this out. Have you tried? And this is another thing I would suggest, like, have you tried calling out to God, whether you believe or not, what do you have to lose by getting in a quiet place I don't care if you're high listening to this right now. What do you have to lose by getting into a quiet place, putting your hands out and saying, Jesus Christ, I don't even know how to pray, but I need you now. I need your guidance. I need freedom from this. I just need you now. What do you have what do you have to lose by trying that? What do you have to lose by stepping into a church service? If you don't change your behaviors, you'll never change your results. Mm-mm. Okay? So you've given some options. There. Yeah. John, what else would you like to share with the folks here in the next couple of minutes? Well, I, it's good seeing you again, Pastor you Randy. Too. We connected you. when you first started a better yes, life round through I Bob Antrim. That well, uh, uh, Buffet Bob, he likes to call yes. himself, and uh, so it's been cool. And I went to my training uh, for peer support in West Lafayette, and I landed at a better life beyond his hope. And I was like, these things are everywhere. Yes, they are everywhere. So uh, it's good seeing you again, um, and it's good seeing what's happened with that little bank building. And just some people willing to chase recovery, what that has turned into. Absolutely. It's kind of a story of like, it doesn't take all of the resources we think it does. It's just start getting together. If you're thinking about starting a group, just start it. Start it tomorrow. If you're thinking about reaching out to somebody, do it now. Just, you know, don't push it off. The trip begins with the first step. The journey, maybe that's a better choice term. And yeah, and so we have a a service we do in Marion at God's House on Friday nights. we do worship. It's a similar model to a better life. Brianna's hope have testimonies and where's God's house. Give it's downtown. It's, it's downtown Marion. So you can, you can um, like detox ministries on Facebook, or you can follow me or, you know, send me a friend request, John Humphreys. Um, and I, I post all of that stuff and we're about to move it over to a page. But if you're trying to connect with us right now, uh, John Humphreys, on Facebook. Spelled your last name for their clarity. H-U-M-P-H-R-I-E-S. Thanks. And then Detox Ministries is on there. Um, and we'll we'll do that stuff. And also, if you want, we have a lot of people with testimonies. Um, and we go out and we talk, um, share our testimonies where, you know, whenever we're asked to. And you can you can email us at Cody and John 2 at gmail.com. Cody and John two yes at gmail dot com mm-hmm. and that's for like we're like I said we're doing prevention stuff with the schools which obviously we're not um, the faith stuff you know we we maneuver sure. around that but we also do if anybody wants to have me or him or any of our team come in and share our stories uh, or you know share what God's done for us we love. We lo- that's how I got connected with you driving to Dunkirk. You know, just we love to go out and tell people what God has done for us. And I promise um, it's really powerful when we start sharing testimonies. That's why I think the services that do that have been the ones that have, you know, with, withstood we time. We relate, and we yeah. can't tell our story without telling someone else's. They're, they're shaking their head yes, going, mm-hmm. yep. Yeah. I was there at that same spot. And yeah. you see somebody who's been able to overcome through the strength of Christ and whatnot. Yeah. Hey, that provides greater hope than they had when they got there. Amen. 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 One final question. Take about 30 seconds and answer this. The title of our podcast is Faith in Your Recovery. What do those four words mean to you? Faith in your recovery. Faith in my recovery. Faith is my recovery. There's no recovery in my life without faith. I'm not here without an encounter with Christ, and I don't. I don't stay. I don't stay stable in my recovery without the the mentors and the people that you know are following Christ too. 
so fast. So for me, I know everybody has a different path, but for me, even in your steps and everything like that, there's it, faith is faith is um, intertwined in all of it. And I'm not here talking to you. I don't have custody of my daughters. I don't impact anybody's life without faith. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you for your time with us today, your willingness to share. And folks, don't forget, continue to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Tell a friend about us. Leave us a comment or send us an email to podcast at ablbh.org. And above all, remember, don't give up on yourself or others. and Don't give in to the urge. Your answer, your healing, your recovery may be just around the corner or in our next episode. Have faith in your recovery by having faith in yourself, your journey, and above all, God. Believe and keep fighting the battle. God bless.